What's a pet peeve of mine? What's a pet peeve of yours? Yeah. That, um, that should be really easy. Like my, yeah, when I say, um. Mm. <laughs> fly or dive? Or fly or drive? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely drive. Love road trips. If you could take us on a fun trip anywhere, where would we go? I know where we'd go. Italy. Yeah, maybe we would or stop in England on the mm -hmm. way. A tour, a, European of, a tour of Europe. Okay, fly or drive? Fly. Vanilla or pumpkin spice? Vanilla. Christmas or Easter? Christmas. Huskies or cougars? Cougars. Mountains or oceans? Mountains. Stay in or go out? Pro mm, depends on my mood. I feel that, yeah. Because some days I'm just sick and tired of people, but then like other days I just want to be around others and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. What is my go-to snack? Your go-to snack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be chips. Something, something salty. Salty, and then you got something sweet with it. What's a pet peeve of mine? <laughs> I have to actually think of more. Um, when I ask you if you hate me. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Christ Center. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Tim, and I'm one of the staff members here. Usually I'm working with the staff and the budget and kind of the operational side of things, but today I get to be with you and to just share a little bit as we're working through the series that we're in. We're in a series right now that's called Home Team, and this series is all about relationships. How many of us know that relationships really matter, like a lot? <laughs> relationships are what make up the fabric of our lives. And when our relationships are going well, we often feel good about life. There's a sense of unity, of harmony, of peace, what the Bible would call shalom, which we'll talk about in a second. But when our relationships are not going well, we can feel this inner dissonance, this pain, relational strife, and that can lead to isolation and loneliness and even long-term damage. And we can kind of feel it in our culture right now. We're so, <clears throat> excuse me, polarized you can feel that dissonance, and it's affecting our relationships. When our relationships are not going well, we feel it. The former U.S. Surgeon Journal recently wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review titled Work and the Loneliness Epidemic. He writes that the most common pathology we, he saw as a doctor was not heart disease or diabetes or cancer. It was loneliness. Just people. Alone. He says, it has more than doubled since the 1980s that well over 40% of Americans report suffering from loneliness at significant levels. And experts expect the actual total is considerably higher because people are just reluctant to say, I feel lonely. And with the recent pandemic and the rise of social media and technology, we are seeing loneliness and relational isolation climb to staggering heights in our culture. And more than ever, more than ever, People live apart from family, apart from friends. And that's particularly true in large cities. People do not move to the city for relationships. They do it for opportunity, money, jobs, education. But loneliness can really be fatal. He writes, it's worse for your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And it crushes the soul. That's why we have small groups here at Christ Center, because we believe in community, and that's why our small group's motto is join a small group or die. Just kidding, that's not actually our motto. <laughs> but the point is that relationships matter. Your relationships matter, and they matter a lot. They're the fabric of your life. And guess what? Relationships matter to Jesus. A new command I give you, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not that you can out-argue anybody, not that you're so smart, just love. Dallas Willard is quoted for saying, God's aim in human history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself included as its primary sustainer and the most glorious inhabitant. 
with billions of people in the world, somebody ought to come up with a system where nobody is lonely, where everyone can have community, a home team for everybody. And somebody did. And it's called the church, actually. Many people, when they hear the word church, think of a place you go like this, like a building for a service that you attend. But Jesus had much, much, much more than that in mind. Not a biological family, but a spiritual family, a literal family. One time he was told that his mom and his brothers were looking for him, and this was his response. Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. This is a pretty shocking thing to say, especially in the ancient world, which was a very tribal society. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother, is what Jesus said. Jesus came simply to start a family, God's family, God's home team, and everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And with Jesus, anything is possible. And that's why we're doing this series, because your relationships matter, and we want Kashmir and the Wenatchee Valley and beyond to be a place where God's shalom, his peace, his sense of order lives and dwells among us in our relationships. And you may have been quite disappointed in your own biological family experience. How many of you found your biological family to be a big disappointment? Don't raise your hands. No, don't raise your hands. That was a rhetorical question. But honestly, that was never intended to be your ultimate family. God wants everybody to be part of his family. He aches for it. Jesus died for it. That's what we are here for. That's what we're called to be. And that's why we're doing this series, Home Team, because you matter to God and your relationships matter to God. God designed relationships. He created them. He created the earth. If you remember in the beginning, it was chaos. The earth was formless and void, right? And so he separated And he created dry land and sea, the sky, the heavens. He said it was good. He created vegetation, said it was good. Created animals teeming with life in the sea, said it was good. And then he created man, and it was good. And then the first thing came along that was not good. Does anybody remember what that was? It is not good for a man to be alone. It's just not a good idea, right? Eric's laughing. I don't know what he's laughing at, but it's true. (laughs) And so God created Eve, and community was born. And that's why community matters so much. It's one of our values here at Christ Center to connect in community. And so today we're going to look at a subject that our culture is absolutely fascinated by. It's an aspect of relationships that really matters to God, and it's one that is important for us to talk about. We create heroes where this is their superpower. We put characters into our favorite shows to be simply known for this. We seek out gurus and spiritual directors to learn how to control it. We flock to social media like white on rice to watch it unfold. What am I talking about? Today we're talking about anger. Anger. We all know what anger is. We've all felt it, whether as a small annoyance or as a full-fledged rage. Anger is a human emotion, but when it gets out of control, and turns destructive, it can lead to problems. <laughs> problems at work, problems in your family, personal relationships, and in the overall quality of your life. Thanksgiving is coming up. That's another reason we're doing this series. We're all going to be sitting around the table with our families, right? And the potential for anger, for misunderstanding, for deep dissonance, the potential there is really high. But thankfully, God has some things to say about this that can really help. Has anyone here never been angry before? Can you raise your hand? Never been angry. Eric, you want to come up and teach? Man, Eric's my guy today. (laughs) You should come up and teach. Because the thing is, of course not. We all get angry sometimes. Anger is an emotional response. I don't believe that it's morally wrong. In fact, it can be useful as an alarm that something is wrong inside. Here's an example. I have two kids, an uh, eight-year-old named Micah, that's our daughter, our five-year-old son named Blaze, and I don't think I've ever been as angry as this one morning, 5 a.m., and Blaze gets up early. If you've heard me talk about him, he just gets up early every morning. I'm in a dead sleep, probably like three layers down in REM, having an inception dream. You know, I'm just way down deep. And Blaze comes in and jumps on me, both knees, right in the gut, and he's so happy to see me. And what do I do? Do I go, oh, 
loud, please. No, my body has a physiological reaction where I'm so jolted awake that I jump up and I'm turning from Bruce Banner into the Hulk right before his very eyes because I feel alarmed, I feel angry, I feel disturbed. And he's like, oh my goodness, what have I done, right? The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. James, the brother of Jesus, writes this, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So anger produces things in our lives, but it does not produce what God wants for us. It does not produce His righteousness. Paul writes, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It doesn't produce what God wants in our relationships. It doesn't create a flourishing, peaceful life like Paul's writing about, a life of contentment that Paul instructs us towards. Anger will not produce that peace with everyone life that God calls us to. Anger produces things in the life of John Wick, maybe, or the Hulk, revenge, destruction, hurt. And there's a reason that we kind of like watching these shows, right? You feel a little bit, like, interested And I think that the real reason is because there's something wrong with our world at a base level, and it's called sin, and we want to see it set to right, right? We want to see justice. We want to see things put back to right, but ultimately that is reserved for God. Only God's anger can create righteousness. But I got news for you today, yours and mine cannot. It's just not possible. Generally, what anger produces in our relationships is actually the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in our relationships right here in our community. Think about the fruit, the produce of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Think about it. You can say it with me if you want. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Some of you get a gold star, and then people that didn't say it get a double gold star because everybody's welcome here. It doesn't matter if you know it or not. I guess when I think about what anger produces in me, it sounds kind of like the opposite of that list. I don't know about you. I'm pretty sure my home team, my closest relationships, my family and friends would tell you when I'm angry, I'm actually less loving, right? I'm less joy-filled. I'm less peaceful. I'm less patient. I'm less kind. I'm less good to be around. I'm less full of faith. I'm less gentle. When I'm angry, it's like I'm barely hanging on to self-control. I was in traffic the other day, and enough said. That's all I need to say, right? Because we've all been there in traffic when somebody cuts you off. This was, this was a real thing. It was very, very, like, bad traffic, and there's nowhere to go. And everyone know who this person is that's, like, weaving in and out and trying to get ahead, and it's like, where are you going, bro? Like, I yeah, go around on the right, that's fine, but you can't get there. Eric, maybe that's you. You're looking at me. It's probably you who's always doing that. No. But I was so angry, so frustrated. It was just this injustice. Like, what are you going to do? I'm going. I'm in the fast lane. There's somebody in front of me. I mean, I really, I honestly came this close to giving them the one-way sign, if you know what I mean. But I didn't. I didn't. But anger is in our nature, And God wants to give you, this is the key, God wants to actually give us a new nature, a holy nature. In fact, Jesus said that being angry with someone and lashing out against them is the same as murder. That calling someone a fool or an idiot leaves you just as guilty and just as subject to destruction as if you were to kill someone. Can you believe that? I don't know if I actually believe that. But that's what he said. Now, those words from him are in Matthew chapter 5, and what he is doing here in what is famously known as the Sermon on the Mount is resetting the law for God's people. The religious leaders of the day were so concerned with appearing righteous, for checking the outward list, but inward, not paying any attention. And they were missing the point of God's law, which was all about inner health, inner love, a new nature. God said, Jesus said in that, in that passage, that you can tell a good tree because it produces good fruit of the nature, right? Every tree produces fruit according to its nature. A bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. And that whole passage of Scripture is about getting a new nature, a new nature. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders 
will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is even angry with a brother or sister is already subject to judgment. You see, his aim here is to call people to true holiness, holiness that is not achieved by just outward behavior, do not murder. If you don't do the deed, then you're good, which is what the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, were all concerned about, what they looked like on the outside, but not paying attention to what was going on on the inside. And the fruit that was coming out of that was not good. Jesus was calling us to a holy nature, a new nature from within, and God wants us to become a new kind of people who are healthy and whole and holy. Slow to speak and slow to become angry is what the book of James says. God wants us to become the kind of people who get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, evil speaking, along with every form of malice. That's what the book of Ephesians says. God wants us to receive His nature, The book of Psalms says this about the nature of God. The Lord is compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's slow to anger. Abounding in love. And maybe you're here today and you just need to hear this. I don't know where you're at or where you think you're at on the moral scale of humanity, but I don't think God is angry with you. I don't think God's angry with you. I think God is the most patient, loving person to exist. And I believe he's here right now. And maybe you grew up in a home that was full of anger. Maybe you grew up with a parent figure um, that left you emotionally scarred, damaged. I just want you to know something. God is not angry with you. He loves you and he stands ready to meet you wherever you find yourself today. And the good thing about God is he'll meet you there, but he never leaves us there. He always invites us to a next step. That's why one of our values at this church is to follow Jesus. Because you can meet Jesus wherever you're at, but he's going to invite you to follow him, to take a next step. And we see these characters of God, these characteristics of God in the life of Jesus himself. How many opportunities for what you might call and I might call just or righteous anger did Jesus have? After his first sermon when the crowds drove him out of the temple to the edge of the town to kill him, after the religious leaders set trap after trap after trap for him, when he was betrayed by his close friend Judas, when he was wrongfully accused, when he was hung on a cross, what did he say? Did he get angry? No, Peter got angry and he rebuked him. He hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. There's one sort of famous story in the Gospels you may be thinking of, one time where we think Jesus might have gotten angry, although it does not explicitly say that he was angry. This story is mentioned in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and John 2, where Jesus goes into the temple and drives out the money changers with a whip that he braided himself, by the way. (laughs) And John quotes a a psalm when describing it, saying, zeal for your house consumes me. Passion for your house consumes me. But then according to the account in Matthew and Mark, Jesus immediately sits down and begins healing everybody and teaching. And again, the anger of God always finds a way to lead to quick action, restorative action and righteousness. The first time that we see God expressing anger is with Moses and the children of Israel. You can go back and take a look at that story. But immediately he sets out a plan to fix things and to change things. He's slow to anger. I think the goal for you and me is for our home team to be like this, to be like God, to be compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Just think about that. If we were the kind of community, the kind of church, that if you're at Thanksgiving with your family, what do they think about when they think about you? Oh, man, when I think about Eric, I think about him being compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. That's the kind of characteristics that we want to mark our community in our pursuit of Jesus, of following Jesus. So here are three things that I want to encourage all of us to do when it comes to anger. And anger is something that I've also wrestled with, I'd say, my whole life. And so I'm a work in progress myself. I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. My family can tell you, yep, we've seen Dad get angry. In fact, Blaze, my son, sometimes will even correct me. I'll get really angry, and then he'll come back later and say, Dad, you know what might have been? I'm not kidding. He's five years old. He's got wisdom. He'll say, Dad, you know what might have been better? 
maybe we could have just sat down, like played a game and talked about it. <laughs> it's literally, he has said that to me. And I look at Brittany and I'm like, man, my pride is so wounded right now because that's, that's a good idea. So just three practical things that we can all do in our home teams with our relationships as we're going to Thanksgiving. And you may be even thinking about a relationship right now that's a little strained, dissonant, where you don't feel like there's that peace of God. And here's the first thing, the very, very first thing, the place to start is be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with God's Spirit, which He makes available to us. In that Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was talking about, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I say, do not get angry. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. When He goes through this list, He says at the end of that, be perfect, therefore, as I am perfect. And it's like, man, how can I possibly do that? But He was pointing, driving to the cross, even in that message, driving to new creation, which he was going to pioneer himself through his death and resurrection, and he was driving to the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is the manifested expression of God in God's people in the church. That's the gift that we have, and thereby we are empowered to live the life that Jesus called us to live. So the first step in learning how to deal with and handle properly your anger is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot, by your own willpower, conquer your anger. We need God's Spirit. We need a new nature to produce new fruit. We remember the fruits of the Spirit, how the Spirit of God produces the opposite of what anger stands ready to produce at any given time. Paul writes in Galatians, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And so here's how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you ready? It's this really big, hard, difficult thing that you probably won't understand, but I'll try to explain it well. You just ask God. You just ask God. Jesus said in the Gospel according to Luke, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is perfect, give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks? Anyone who asks. All you need to do is ask, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And you know what? If you want to be prayed for today to receive the Holy Spirit, our prayer team is going to be here during the last song after service, and you can come on down, and they would love to to pray for you. If you want to take that first step to learning how to deal with and handle that inner dissonance, that anger, I encourage you to do that. And I try to make it a habit, honestly, every day, every morning. I'm not perfect at it. I fail miserably sometimes, but I try to make it a habit, and I connect it with taking a shower, right? Because I want to get washed every day, and I want to be washed in the Spirit. And every day when I take a shower, I just say, Holy Spirit, Fill me today. Father, fill me with your spirit. Give me your eyes to see. Give me your ears to hear. Give me your heart for people. Help me to bring you and your presence and all the fruit of your spirit into every situation I find myself. And of course I'm not perfect, but it starts there. It's an orientation, a calibration to God. Our pastor Steve Haney says this, when you are walking in the spirit and demonstrating the fruit of the spirit, it's hard to be angry. When you are full of love, it's hard to be full of anger. When you're full of joy, it's hard to be full of anger. When you're full of peace, it's hard to be full of anger. And there is this thing where it's not just trying to get rid of something, but it's grabbing on to something else, something new, something better, something that takes its place. Isn't that true? Be filled with something else, with God's Spirit. It has to start there every day, every day. Second thing that I want to encourage you to think about doing in your journey with your own anger and frustration is to just be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself about your anger. This is what is called humility, actually. Humility is just acknowledging and embracing the reality about yourself, the truth about you. False humility is like, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not actually good at that when you actually are. True humility, right? You can meet someone who says, thank you, yep, that's, I feel proficient at that. 
And it can still feel like humil- humility because it's just acknowledging reality. Be honest with yourself. Anger is a signal to your body that something's wrong, that there's unresolved pain, trauma, or hurt that needs attention. And it's important to be honest with yourself and to start the work of learning about your own anger. Grow in self-awareness. Ask yourself, ask your home team, how do you experience me? Why am I angry? One thing that never works when it comes to trying to control anger is to just say, don't be angry, right? Stop being angry. It's like that old Saturday Night Live sketch with Bob Newhart. Anybody know this? Maybe not. There's a therapist seeing a patient. The therapist asks, what's wrong? And the patient talks about all these things that she's struggling with, and he listens, kind of this wise old therapist. Okay, well, I'm going to say two words to you, he says. They're very important. I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to take them with you out of my office. I want you to incorporate these two words into your life. She says, well, should I, should I write them down? Do I need a pen? I don't, I don't have a paper. And he says, no, no, no. Most people can remember them. They're just two words. He says, okay, are you ready? Are you listening? Okay, here they are. Stop it! Just stop it! Okay, what else do you got, is what he says. And she's like, I, I, that's why I'm here, right? Because I don't know how to stop it. Nothing makes me angrier than when someone says, hey, stop being angry, right? And you're like, you don't understand. <laughs> but there's something that needs to be paid attention to. It's an alarm. It's a signal that something's wrong. Something needs fixing in your life, in your heart. When I was a kid, I grew up right here in Kashmir up on Rank Road, and I would spend hours playing outside in the hills, in the orchards. At that time, it was all orchards. Now it's like all houses, which is a great idea. Maybe you own one of them. But it was all orchards, and one of my favorite things to do was to find a big rock and flip it over and see what was underneath, right? There's the creepy crawly things. There's, if you're lucky, there's a couple roly polies. There's some worms. I think that's kind of like anger because anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is always hiding something else that's wrong. Anger is like that rock. And it's hiding things you probably need to know about and pay attention to and learn about. Here's an easy pattern for me. When I'm trying to learn about anger or notice it, I feel angry, you can just think about this or write it down. Pause, breathe, and pray. (laughs) It's like when Blaze jumps on me at 5 a.m. in the morning, both knees to the gut, I feel that reaction, I just have pause. Just probably whatever I'm gonna do right now is not a good idea. Let's just stop for a second, right? Probably hitting send on that email, that's probably not a good idea. Why don't we just pause for a second? Probably saying whatever is just rushing through my brain right now, probably not a good idea. I'm just gonna pause and I'm gonna breathe and I'm gonna connect again to my body and get out of my head and seeing red and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, God, what's really going on? What's really going on? Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. A great orienting prayer. And this is a journey. This is a process. And in this process, you may want to seek out counsel from a licensed professional. I have. I've gone to therapy. It has changed my life and helped me so much. You might want to seek out a pastor or a trusted friend who can really dig into the root of your anger. What is going on here? And here's the last thing, the third point. Be committed to repair attempts. Be committed to repair attempts. This is another way of saying, an unchurchy way of saying, be committed to reconciliation, of always going back. Because when we're angry, It creates rifts in our relationships, right? We hurt somebody, we feel hurt. Jesus said, if you're taking your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come back and offer your gift. There's this idea that God cares actually more than your songs, more than raising your hands in worship, more than going to church every Sunday. God cares about reconciliation. And that can only come through being committed to repair attempts. The key is we have to stay committed to it. John Gottman is one of the premier minds on relationships in our day. Maybe you've heard of him. He's done incredible amounts of research on relationships and can boil down some key predictors in relationships that signal in a rela- if a relationship is going to survive. Have any of you heard of John Gottman before? Okay. 
And one of those key signals, those attributes that is in surviving relationships is that both parties are committed to repair attempts. We just, we try. At least I show up, right? And maybe you're sitting here thinking and listening, man, when's the last time I went to my spouse and said, hey, honey, I was wrong. I messed up. You went to your best friend and said, you know what, we fought about this. Maybe I, maybe I was wrong. I want to I wanna at least try to repair something here. Or you go to your parent because they yelled at you and you feel really hurt and you go, hey, you know what? You really hurt me and I, I want to repair. I don't know how. But commit, commit, commit to repair attempts. Let's be a community where we commit to repair, where we don't just let it fester, where we don't let it go, where we don't give the devil a stronghold in our relationships. It's an incredible resource, the Gottman Institute for Relationships. You can check it out at Gottman.com, actually, if you're interested in finding out more. With your spouse, try to repair. With your kids, try to repair. And if you're a parent like me, maybe you need some resources, some help in parenting. One source that my wife and I have found incredibly helpful is goodinside.com. Dr. Becky has workshops, videos, tips. It is an amazing resource if you're a parent. And she has a lot to say about making repair attempts. She says that parents who retain relationship with their kids into adulthood, the single most contributing factor is repair attempts. You may mess it up. You may blow it. You may yell at your kids. You may fly off the handle. But if you go back and say, hey, I I blew it. Hey, I'm sorry. I was wrong. That's the biggest indicator. So as a community, let's commit to repair attempts. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to pay attention to our anger and learn what's that all about. And we want to commit to always trying to repair with each other. Always trying to repair with each other, no matter what. Here's the last thing I want to say about anger. Not one of us is perfect, right? We've said that about Christ Center. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's welcome. And with Jesus, anything is possible. And I struggle with this one. I've struggled with this one for a long time. I've been chipping away at it. I'm still working at it. And I want to be honest with you about it, my family, my home team. But Jesus came to save sinners. He came to save us. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick, the lost, the wicked, the messed up, the dysfunctional, the needy, the greedy, the seedy people like you and me. But there's something about churches when people gather on a weekend that we can kind of become the church of the immaculate pretender, right? In fact, this morning I had a conversation with someone here and I just said, hey, how you doing? This person looked at me and just said, not great. And I so appreciated that because we can kind of put on this veneer, this shine at church, these relationships of, hey, I got it together, you know, how's it going? Doing great. You might have been fighting, running late, screaming all the way in the minivan, but when you get to church, we're doing great. Job is great. Family's great. Marriage is great. Kids are great. Dog is great. But that will kill a church. It will kill our church. And it will kill a soul. Every sinner leads a double life. Sin is that way. It just is. How do we get free? Well, we could start by taking these little steps forward together. Be filled with the Spirit. Be honest with yourself. Commit to repair attempts in all of your relationships. Let's do it together. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to follow you. We believe there is no problem in life that apprenticeship to you cannot solve. There is no problem in life that we face today that following you, Jesus, cannot solve. So God, help us to spend time with you. Help us to be filled with your spirit. Help us to get honest with ourselves. And God, help us to commit to reconciliation, which is something you care about so much. I pray for my friends right now as we're going uh, into the holidays. We're thinking about Thanksgiving and Christmas. God, you know the dynamics of every relationship sitting around every table, every living room. And God, you know the person that's thinking today, where am I going to spend Thanksgiving? Where am I going to spend Christmas? Jesus, would we be the kind of community where everybody has a home team, 
that we wouldn't just say, yes, go, be well fed and in peace, but do nothing about it. Help us to be vulnerable with each other and to rise up to meet each other's needs. And in so doing, bring your peace, your intended design for community right here in Kashmir, the Wenatchee Valley, and beyond. And we pray all this in your powerful, beautiful, wonderful name, Jesus. Amen.